the British pull out of Philadelphia to join their troops in New York. Washington sees his chance and goes for it. After six months at Valley Forge, he puts everything his troops have learned to the test. This is the first Revolutionary War battlefield in the country ever to be excavated. Monmouth Battlefield in Freehold, New Jersey, is the site of that pivotal battle. Archaeologist Dan Sibilich looks for hard evidence that the training at Valley Forge paid off in combat. All right, what we're looking for today up here is military ordnance. We're looking for lead canister shot, lead musket balls, and of course our iron grape shot. The project has taken over 13 years, with over 80 volunteers scouring more than 1,500 acres of farmland for clues to what really happened here. Artifacts are fun to dig out of the ground, but by themselves really don't mean anything unless you can interpret what the relationship is between the number of artifacts in the field. In the field, flags mark the precise location of every object. In the lab, each discovery forms part of a vast database connected to custom-designed CAD software. CAD stands for computer-aided design. And this gives us an idea of what's going on out in the field. The computer calculates the firing range of each cannon to recreate a precise map of the battlefield. What we are looking at here are all of the military artifacts found in the area that we were uh, searching earlier. And what we see is something happened here. There's a, there's a large conflict of activity going on here. June 24th, 1778, Hopewell, New Jersey. Gentlemen, I have called this council of war to discuss the feasibility of attacking Clinton's troops in New Jersey. Planning for the battle, Washington finds himself in conflict with his own officers. Topping the list, General Charles Lee, a former lieutenant colonel in the British Army. He envied General von Steuben. He didn't like the way Washington had moved so close to this man. As you all may be aware, I firmly believe it is time to attack Clinton. Lee is Washington's number two and a bitter rival. Lee isn't buying that von Steuben's training at Valley Forge has turned the army around, and he's convinced that Americans will never stand up to the British in a head-to-head -head fight. June 28th, Monmouth, New Jersey. At 5 a.m., Washington spies send word. 2,000 redcoats lag behind the main British army. Washington orders Lee to engage the enemy. He's about to find out whether Lee's low opinion of his troops might just be right. It's almost noon, 96 degrees in the shade. Washington listens for the heated clash of battle, but all he hears are a few lukewarm pot shots. By mid-afternoon, he runs into his own troops, moving away from the action. Boy, step forward. Yes, sir. Under whose command are you? General Lee, sir. Then what, may I ask, are you doing walking in this direction? He orders us to retreat, sir. That is a bold-faced lie and cowardice. Arrest this deserter. No, but sir, he, he bit. How many more? When he spots one of Lee's colonels heading away from the enemy, Washington has seen enough. What is the meaning of this retreat, sir? The meaning Stop of this the retreat? Picture. I don't want you to miss this one. The father of our country is now so angry that according to some historians, he actually swears you may want the kids to leave the room. OK, George, go ahead, sir. Damn him! Yeah! Yeah! What we know for sure is that Washington takes charge himself. Suddenly, the redcoats are on top of them. It's a moment one eyewitness, the Marquis de Lafayette, will never forget. General Washington seemed to arrest fortune with one glance. His presence stopped the retreat. I thought, then as now, that I had never beheld so superb a man. So Washington simply takes over. He directs a couple delaying actions. And then Washington rides back to the hill that's about 500 yards over there and starts to lay out the defensive line along the, the ridge. Now, British grenadiers advance relentlessly into a thicket called the Point of Woods. They pull out a weapon the Americans fear even more than British gunfire. This is a soldier's bayonet. This is an original from the Revolutionary War. You have to put a foot on your enemy to push him off of it to get him out. 
And this bayonet would also be outlawed later on in history because a triangular bayonet creates a wound which is not easily repaired and sewn. For the Americans, it's the most dangerous psychological moment of the battle. And the British expect the Yanks to crack. This was the soldier's intimidating weapon. So there is a psychological impact that goes with that. They're going to see you coming at them with bayonets fixed. Not a pretty sight. You want to stick around and find out if they know how to use them? Probably not. The urge would be to skedaddle to the rear. Up until this time, they had no skill with the bayonet. And bayonet charges by the British had frequently sent them fleeing. But that was then, and this is now. Archaeologists have found evidence of the sacrifices the Americans make that day. This is a musket ball that a soldier popped into his mouth when people were being operated on or just in, in terrible pain to keep from chipping their own teeth or biting their tongue. They would put a musket ball between their teeth and bite down on it. That's where the expression, bite the bullet, comes from. And this is a musket ball that was absolutely flattened by someone in excruciating pain. Americans bite the bullet, hold their ground. Von Steuben's lessons have stuck. This was one of the crucial moments of the American Revolution. They met them, bayonet for bayonet. And there was these tremendous clashes all over the battlefield. And some of their officers came right into the mouths of the American guns and were shot dead. And, the, and their, their soldiers followed them. The next thing you know, the British were retreating. But they could not break the American line. This deadly skirmish buys George Washington precious time to set up his artillery on the high ground. The cannons pound the British troops. It's the longest field artillery duel of the entire war. In the three-hour clash, thousands of rounds are fired. This is the area where the 42nd Regiment was getting shelled very heavily by the American artillery. The artillery line was behind me about 800,000 yards, approximately where the front of the tree line there. Archaeologists have found dozens of cannon shots and studied their blast patterns. We can see an absolute amazing blast pattern from the guns into the orchard. 73.4. Right now, we're looking at the two ounce grape shot blast pattern from the American artillery line onto the, into the orchard where the 42nd was. Uh, and they fired three rounds of grape shot, bags of kind of giant steel ball bearings like this. So imagine bags of this burning as they came out of the muzzle of the gun, and then this handful of iron balls just hissing towards you. The evidence provides intriguing clues to a legendary figure who may have fought here. A gun that may well have been manned that day by a figure known to legend as Molly Pitcher. Molly Pitcher, because of running water back and forth to the artillery pieces as well as to the thirsty soldiers. There you go. I got some water. Anybody want Dan Sivilich believes Molly's real name was Mary Hayes. Hi. According to legend, when her husband falls to enemy fire, Molly Pitcher steps in. She took a gun position, um, running ammunition from the, uh, from the gun box up to the muzzle of the gun. Eyewitness Joseph Plum Martin picks up the story. A cannon shot from the enemy passed directly between her legs, carrying away all the lower part of her petticoat. Looking at it with apparent unconcern, she continued her occupation. Just how much of the Molly Pitcher legend is true remains a source of controversy. But the heroism of the Continental Artillery, Pennsylvania Brigade, is beyond dispute. American cannons zero in on the elite British 42nd Regiment, known as the Black Watch. Among the most feared soldiers in the British Army. But the British Regiment will flank the American artillery, unless Washington snipers can pin them down first. American sharpshooters have been carefully positioned on the Monmouth battlefield. But can they stop Britain's elite Black Watch? For the first time, scientists can measure the damage the snipers could have inflicted. A tight cluster of 60 caliber musket balls, proof of marksmen with firearms experts believe were made in America. 
something very feared by the British was the American rifle. We've got snipers with American rifles, which are deadly at 200 yards. Probably have a soldier firing down the diagonal of the trees at specific targets. And they're sitting out there just trying to pick off anything that moves. How effective were they? Experts believe this button was most likely worn by a member of the British 42nd. And as you can see, there's a section that's sheared off, nice and round sheared off, which indicates it was probably hit by a musket ball. The force of this ball was from back to front, which means that the soldier was wearing it, was hit in the back, and the projectile came through his body and out the front and through the button. The button was the last thing hit. Chances are the soldier who got hit with this did not survive. They're finding the American snipers fired a deadly kind of musket ball they didn't even know was used in the Revolutionary War. These are equivalent to today's modern dum-dum bullets. We have a sniper who's taken those round balls and hammered them down into cylinders. This would come out tumbling. And when it hits you, it would rip the flesh, rip the organs inside, and it does irreparable damage. 5 p.m., June 28th. Britain's finest are caught between fierce artillery fire and advancing American infantry. And elsewhere on the battlefield, the American lines hold. If this was the Americans' test, they aced it. This is the first time that the main Continental Army saw the main British Army turn their backs and withdraw. For the British, it's a serious setback. For von Steuben's troops schooled at Valley Forge, it's graduation day. But before the Americans can win a clear-cut victory, British forces withdraw to a camp half a mile away. The final outcome of the battle is still in doubt. But tomorrow, first light will reveal who the winners really are. At dawn, Washington and his troops arrive at the British camp. It's deserted. The English have slipped away in the night, forfeiting the victory to the Americans. It's a break for the army and a breakthrough for their leader. This is also a real milestone in Washington's career. After Monmouth, after this victory, uh, there are no longer any questions. Washington is the undisputed commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. With spring, the people of the colonies warmed to their leader and his cause. Valley Forge did more than transform the American army. It also transformed the opinions of a lot of Americans who were civilians, trying to make up their mind which way to go with this war. In the afterglow of history, Valley Forge becomes a squeaky clean symbol of the American spirit. But for the men who went through the crucible, it was about grinding hardships, not glory. Today, archaeologists are finding out just how difficult their ordeal really was. They had tenacity, for want of a better word, of an army that refused to dissolve. Every scrap of evidence, every piece of metal, every bone fragment is, is just unbelievable testament to the sacrifice and devotion of these soldiers. By the time the war is over, many who once thought Washington incompetent now want to crown him king. And England's King George is certain the American George will go for it. When the war was over, George III was told by an American in London that Washington was planning to return to Mount Vernon. He wasn't going to become an Oliver Cromwell, a great dictator. And George said, sir, if he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. And by God, he was. And von Steuben? Washington promotes him to be the official inspector general of the army. Washington grew so fond of von Steuben that it's no exaggeration to say that he was one of the two or three officers in the whole army uh, for which he had genuine fellow feeling.